A very good evening to everybody. We want to welcome us to um, another presentation on CESAR things. We want to sincerely appreciate your, your esteemed presence here and uh, for making this event come uh, to be. We are glad to have the pleasure of having again with us, Professor Alice Sizingre. Professor Alice Sizingre uh, was of the, um, has been a name or it to be reckoned with in research on economics for developing countries, especially African countries, for over four decades now. She's been, help, she been giving us lots of lectures here at the Beg, and um, we are lucky to have her now with us. She was at SOAS, uh, the uh, School of African Studies in London for years before, um, and um, she is here with us to give us uh, yet another lecture. She is also a, a senior researcher at the Paris North Economic uh, Center and also a science uh, at the poll uh, 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 senior researcher and a professor for many years. We are lucky to have her give us from her wealth of experience. And we are glad that we are here having with us uh, one of the mothers of, the, of, of CESAR, Professor, Juliana, professor Joanna <laughs> Pereira. We are glad that she's here with us today. Uh, I thought she would do the introduction because I was telling her that I'm too tiny to do the introduction where my bosses are here. <laughs> we are glad also that uh, we have the pleasure of having Professor Pew <laughs> and Professor uh, uh, Jessica with us. Uh, we will be starting off the session. Professor Alice Zingre will be speaking to us on understanding the determinants of growth in developing countries via the uh, examples of China, Sub Saharan African economic relationships. Thank you very Thank much. You very much <laughs> I am blushing. It is true that I am, uh, if I may say, uh, old compagnon de route. Do you say compagnon de route in mm -hmm. Portuguese, mm -hmm. in English, uh, of uh, César? And I'm extremely happy to come back to you. Lisbon and to see again my colleagues and friends and César, the new César, uh, and to present uh, my research uh, here. Uh, first of all, is it recorded uh, in Zoom? Or so, so it means that other students will be able to see the presentation later on. Uh, later on, on so it's quite important yeah. because, in fact, uh, I followed the, your suggestion, recommendation to present a topic which could be with a wide uh, audience uh, and with a pedagogic uh, uh, objective, that is to, to teach and to transmit some knowledge, not to, trans, not to discuss a very minuscule research question, uh, very sophisticated uh, small research question. But I thought that uh, I chose this uh, topic of China-Africa economic relationship uh, in an economic perspective, because I saw that given it is an extremely heated debate today, what is the impact of China on Africa? For one decade, the literature on, uh, on, on, on China Africa is absolutely exploding. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it is starting to become a kind of uh, mature, uh, mature literature. Uh, but this debate is, is, is still something really important. And given it is mobilizing uh, many, many domains of economic research and also political economy, of course, I saw that it was a good topic because precisely for students to, and students usually read, uh, students of Africa usually read a lot of things on China, Africa. Uh, it's really something which has become quite uh, heated in the sense that there's a pro-China and the against China. China is developing or China is exploiting, etc., etc. So I thought that it could be really interesting to make a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, general review uh, of what we can argue today and uh, re regarding this issue. And First, there is an argument. It is not a review of the literature, of course, there is plenty of uh, uh, essays. I don't speak Chinese, so it's not first hand uh, uh, research regarding China. Um, there is an argument, uh, which is a, a line supporting the, the entire presentation. There is a paper, it may be later, it can be also a working paper, uh, which is uh, precisely what can we think 
regarding uh, whether China-Africa, the relationship between China and Africa today, do they support economic growth of Sub-Saharan Africa, it is a macro perspective, or not? And the answer will be extremely uh, complex and nuanced which is uh, precisely yes in some uh, perspective, in some regards, and no. And it depends on the, uh, uh, not only the, the domain of the economic relationship, but also within this domain, <coughs> there are arguments for and arguments against. And at, at the end of the presentation, I hope there will be some question and, and discussion for you. What is for you the big picture? Is it something which is positive or not? And also in regarding transmission of uh, tools for reflection for students, uh, I wanted to be a bit more complex and say, okay, when um, a journalist or whatever politician say, oh, uh, China is uh, supporting growth in Southern Africa or China, uh, on the contrary, is something which is bad and negative currently for the continent. The first thing I wanted to highlight is what do we talk about when we talk about growth. So the first the part of the presentation will be what are the current uh, accepted the consensus on what are the determinants of economic growth. Okay, if we want to have a clear idea of is China positive or negative, let us try to understand what are today the uh, the consensus regarding the main determinants of economic growth. What we will see is yes. Sometimes China is filling the box, is uh, ticking the box that is yes, uh, China uh, uh, is a driver of economic growth because of investment, blah, blah, etc., uh, industrialization or whatever. So we will see, of course. Or China, no, no. in fact, doesn't uh, uh, feel the characteristic of the classical determinants of economic growth. And you will see that, in fact, at the end of the day, we, we are not completely uh, sure. Okay, so now, so the argument is also there is a lateral argument, which is, in fact, China, uh, the complexity of this relationship, in fact, don't uh, illustrate fully the traditional theory of what is driving growth today for the developing economies uh, today. And the, um, now the argument will be presented in a bit more in detail, three points. So in fact, the China, uh, China's impact on growth, in fact, has been positive in some domains, as I say, but has been limited by the modalities of the relationship. When I talk about economic relationship between China and Africa, Mostly, I will talk about investment. And you will see that it is incredibly difficult to talk about investment because investment is something, in fact, in the literature, completely confused with construction contracts, I mean, infrastructure contract, which is uh, introducing a huge confusion in the, even in good, good papers. And the second dimension of this relationship is trade. So investment on the one hand, trade on the other hand. So three points. Three points regarding the limitation to contribution to growth given the modalities of this relationship. First, the weight of China, the first point, is in fact uh, China as a weight, which is obvious, so huge at the global uh, at the global level compared to the continent, compared to Sub-Saharan Africa, that in fact uh, African economies so far, including the two giants, <coughs> Nigeria and South Africa, cannot compete with uh, Chinese products. So here we see immediately a complex point that is trade, the trade relationship, in fact, can threaten uh, investment relationship. And in fact, the fact that in, uh, African economies could industrialize uh, by their own. In fact, whatever they do, <coughs> uh, Chinese products with the trade dimension is in fact threatening the capacity for uh, African economies to build their own factories, to produce products which could be internationally uh, competitive. And what is really interesting is that sometimes in some uh, countries, 
the uh, trade the traded uh, Chinese products or imported uh, Chinese products into African economy, in fact, may threaten uh, factories, products, which are the result of investment by Chinese investors. Suppose that a Chinese investor is making, I don't know, some plastic bag or whatever, or uh, not, not food, but let's say whatever, leather, etc. In fact, the uh, uh, sector which can be threatened can be a sector where Chinese investors may have heavily invested as well. So we have a paradox and we have something which is really complex. Of course, it is depending on the countries considered. Uh, let, we come to this uh, later. But here we see a first uh, dimension which is really complex and, and really interesting that is yes and no. Second point. Uh, uh, on the trade front, uh, a substantial part of the relationship China-Africa, you will see the graph, it's a nice dramatic graph, graph it took me one day to, to build, uh, with a completely chaotic uh, series from Octave. Uh, the, the trade relationship China-Africa mostly rely on the trade of primary commodities. Nobody would be surprised. It is something which is widely known, but uh, what is traded between China and Africa is our primary commodities. And uh, I can unveil the mystery. What is the commodity which is mostly traded? It is oil and oil and oil and oil and oil. And, oil. and you will see. <coughs> uh, third, uh, um, so called consensus uh, determinant of economic growth today for whatever uh, economy is uh, since the Nobel Prize um, awarded to Douglas North and Fogel in 93, institution, the dimension of political institution, economic institution, which is now the, the very, uh, is, it has become a traditional determinant of economic growth. So uh, uh, governance, uh, security of uh, property rights, etc., etc. So it is now a canonical uh, determinant of, of uh, determinant of economic growth. Of course, on this third dimension, we will see how complex things are. And China, it is widely in the newspaper, is not entirely, if I may say, fully support uh, the building of institution in uh, Africa. So it is really interesting to see we have at least three main points. Of course, many other points. Then on these three fronts. Uh, the relationship China-Africa uh, are yes and no, contributing or not, to the canonical theory of the determinants of economic growth. And I observe at the end, in fine, and it will be for another uh, presentation, uh, of course, in fact, immediately you can say, but okay, but China here is not very different from the traditional partners of the continent, <clears throat> that is the coloni colonizers and the tra so-called traditional partners in the West, and even so-called non-traditional partners, such as Russia, uh, Turkey, uh, India, etc., which are extremely present in South African economies today, maybe you can ask the question that, okay, we concentrate on China, since China is bad or good or whatever, but the big question is, is China an exception? I mean, is there some exceptionalist, exceptionalist uh, regarding China compared to the other partners? I leave this question absolutely open because of course it could be world history and it's really world history of the entire world and at least two centuries. But this is a completely open question. Uh, and, and I think that it is quite important to, to insist that the China, uh, especially at the beginning of this literature, the China-Africa literature has exploded, let's say, from 10 years ago, or with big names, Ian Taylor, etc. And uh, at the beginning, this uh, literature, the enormous quantity of studies, was really concentrated on the exceptionalism, saying that China is a new opportunity, etc. Now, the literature is a bit like the French soufflé, a bit, uh, uh, dit, uh <laughs> flat a bit more. But this issue of is there something which is really, really specific? I think it's, 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 it's
important uh, issue. So the first section will give some idea of uh, economic growth in Africa before uh, talking about China, Africa regarding uh, determinants of growth. What is uh, the profile? What are the pro different profile of economic growth in Southern Africa at the macro uh, at, at the macro <coughs> level? So this is uh, something uh, people who were last year will recognize one or two graphs. But so, what do we observe? This is a, a per capita. I always took a GDP per capita because I think this is really important uh, to take the per capita perspective because the demography is absolutely crucial, the issue of demography. So many journalists, many uh, studies, even the IMF and World Bank, typically the IFI, usually use uh, GDP growth. I think it is really important to take per capita because, of course, I'm not talking too much about the demographic uh, dimension, but Africa, Southern Africa is the only part of the world which has not started a transition, demographic transition which is an enormous question, I'm not a demographer, but this issue of no demographic transition, especially in some countries, it's Niger, etc., is of course uh, a huge uh, dimension uh, when we talk about economic growth or not, uh, because if, the, if demography is completely off, off, offsetting the, the, the growth uh, dimension, this is a big issue. So what we observe, what we observe in this graph, that is, in fact, I think it's uh, uh, in one second, we see that something which is a mystery, in fact, of South Africa profile is not so different from the profile of the world. I mean, I'm not going to enter into detail, I would be unable in any case because uh, it's very aggregate, except in the 70s, uh, at, at, the, at the time of the first oil shock, etc., where there is a discrepancy, I mean, which is obvious, which I cannot explain. And maybe since what I discovered with untapped series, maybe it is an artifact. This is really something which is worth to, to, to investigate because we see something here, which is, uh, this is the only thing. But here we have something which is really discrepant. Uh, I, one, if, if I have time or once, I'd like to investigate this and uh, which means to read everything which has been published at this period to understand this. Maybe it is a fact, but otherwise you see that in fact the profile is quite similar, which is again militating for uh, there is nothing exceptional, uh, of course, for, the, for Africa, which I insist on in my presentation, that is there is no particular curse, doom, whatever, regarding the continent so far. Of course, with a lot of difference, we can see that the shocks which have affected the whole world, in fact, have affected also Africa and vice versa. That is uh, COVID, we can see <coughs> COVID. But we see the same profile, but of course, something else is still interesting, that is, what is vulnerability? This is here. We can see that COVID, of course, has enormously affected the whole world, but much more mm -hmm. in African economies. And we are not completely surprise. Everybody knows these graphs which are produced every day, every time. Uh, this is a divergence. Uh, so the second dimension of the profile of growth in uh, Southern Africa is of course a profile of uh, divergence vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the rest of the world per capita. And here, to put it very quickly, uh, this divergence is a matter of very heated debate. That is, of course, you can have two perspectives, that is a full, half full or half empty glass. That is, you can say, oh my God, this is a disaster. There is nothing to do anymore. So yeah, it's really diverging, this is a big deal, etc. It's a uh, constant, so it is an inconvenient. But we can be very optimistic and, and say, very optimistic no, but we can be and say that in, in, in fact the per capita income of African economies again Southern Africa is slowly increasing. So it is a bit better than uh, it is in real terms. So this is quite important it's in real term. Uh, and in fact it has been multiplied by two. We can see that it is uh, uh, better than in the uh, 60s in real terms. Uh, so, and this is quite a big uh, stake because some people like me say, 
Oh, the continent seems to be caught in a poverty trap, in a vicious cycle, typically a funding process. But other people, typically within the IFI, say no, there, there are absolutely no characteristic of a poverty trap in such a way. <laughs> This graph is not at all a graph of a poverty trap. So, because the poverty trap is defined by a steady degrowth, disaggregation of growth. So, it's not a poverty trap. And so, I think I, I'm not doing it because it was last year, but just to say that I remind you that this, uh, uh, this is a big debate. Again, if we insert Sub Saharan Africa within the other region, something less aggregated than world in sub saharan Africa, we can see that, of course, this so-called world is something quite complex and not everybody is growing at the same uh, pace. And we can see that, in fact, this is an argument also for the V-shape and the divergence and the poverty trap, which is we have a, a group of, of, of economies which are not doing so well. And in fact, again and again, it is giving you some arguments for the students to please to, to know the kind of the debate. Uh, that is, uh, the, the continent is not doing so badly because other uh, group of economies don't don't uh, behave uh, so well. And typically, <coughs> Latin America, which is not at all my domain, uh, with many economies, by the way relying on commodities, etc., and also poor governance, uh, etc., uh, are not doing so wonderfully. And uh, also, we have this tautological uh, category categorization, which is low-income economies in Southern Africa. And we can see, oh, this is really strange. African economies behave like low-income countries. But of course, because most low-income countries, in fact, 90% of low-income countries are in Africa except Nepal and, and some island economies, etc. So we see a complete superposition of the two. Uh, so it's not a very interesting category. OK, so to go back to this profile of uh, growth, as I said, historically, at the World Bank made very clear paper saying there is no policy trap regarding African economies at all. Africa grow, even if it is a slow growth which is, of course, a very different perspective. And Gervin, so I suppose maybe you have heard about Morton. Gervin was pretty, quite good at breakthrough uh, publication regarding uh, Africa uh, growth statistical tragedy. And for growth, of course, the, for Gervin, uh, the, the, Gervin is more pessimi pessimistic. Uh, and uh, for Javan, in many books he has published, especially uh, in the last 10 years, uh, insists that uh, the big issue, and he's not the only one to say that, uh, plaguing, affecting African economies is the fact that growth is driven by external demand. And of course, because the structure of African economy is a structure of exporting primary commodities, and so it is not a growth like China, which is now based on internal consumption, mm -hmm. but it is uh, a growth which is based on external demand. And this is obvious when your growth is based on external demand. Of course, you are depending on the fluctuation of external demand. And this is not good news when the global world or external demand has COVID, uh, Ukraine war, uh, etc. So a lot of external shocks which is affecting. So this is really a key uh, uh, dimension uh, uh, regarding uh, the first at, at first sight. So, uh, <coughs> African economies are, of course, uh, diverse. So, this is a bit difficult to talk about SSA, but I will do it. Of course, uh, uh, they are uh, extremely uh, diverse. Two giants driving uh, uh, aggregate figures uh, of growth Nigeria, South Africa, representing more than half of SSA. Uh, global uh, uh, GDP, so which is really important. We have 50 or so economies, but two economies which are representing half. So everything is heavily biased because of, of that. Another distinction which is quite important, this is the IMF distinction, and it is a canonical distinction regarding African economies. It is the distinction between resource intensive and non-resource non intensive. This is I think a difficult distinction, but the IMF use it, the, all the IFI use it, so we have to accept this because uh, I personally think that it is really difficult to isolate the resource-based, non-resource-based, because many economies 
Fortunately, don't export only one thing. They can export oil, but it happens that they export something else, but oil is a special case. But let's say they can export, uh, I don't know, uh, iron or gold or etc. but they can export gold and cocoa. Everybody knows that in Ghana, you have cocoa and gold. So uh, gold being a resource intensive, cocoa is not a resource intensive. So this is a difficult distinction, but we have to accept it because most uh, policy recommendations of the IMF are based on this distinction. That is, usually when you read the IMF literature, you have policy papers which are entirely based on the distinction for resource intensive economies, blah, 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 non resource intensive, blah, blah, blah. And what is a resource intensive, by the way? Um, we have to define this. And a resource intensive economy, <coughs> um, a resource is defined by the IMF as a non renewable commodity, which we have to, to know that. Uh, personally uh, recently went back to the definition because I was not sure. And because it's really difficult, what, 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 what you can do, we have, for instance, palm oil. Palm oil is typically a, a, a natural resource for me. An economy which is exporting Indonesia, etc. palm oil uh, is really based on primary commodities. But so the IMF insists non-renewable uh, commodities. So, which is non renewable, that is palm oil or cotton, which are competing uh, primary commodities, are renewable resources. So, they are not classified as resource intensive. But uh, anyway, so what is common, even beyond this distinction, uh, there is some consensus saying that whatever the commodities, diamond, oil, uh, tea, coffee, cotton, uh, Africa is uh, uh, not uh, industrialized. Uh, Southern Africa, uh, part of the world, and primary commodities dominate in uh, export. So we can now periodize African uh, growth. Again, it is incredibly too abrogate, but at least we can uh, try to find some, uh, some periods. And this is a, a, a very difficult question, uh, of course. We, we cannot explain the determinants of economic growth in Africa without, without having some idea of what are the periods. And this is exactly the same graph as two graphs before, but alone. That is, Africa alone, not with the world, but alone. Immediately, you see that there are periods. If we believe in the credibility of figures, because what I discovered uh, uh, last week with the UNTAD series has been an absolute shock. And if somebody wants to work with me, because I really discovered last week that the series of UNTAD are absolutely not the same series, let's say over 40 years, from one year to the other. It's <coughs> been an absolute shock from another year. So, what do you observe here? You observe that uh, growth, and you are not surprised, we really know the history of Africa. So, post independence, we can <coughs> see. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm going to so, quite a uh, mixed uh, period immediately after independence. So, UNTAD data are quite good because they start in 1960. So, uh, um, uh, here it is a growth rate, of course, per capita, a growth rate. We can see that growth rates were above zero quite significantly uh, uh, after uh, in the early 70s. Then we have the famous lost decades. Maybe you have heard about this expression by Bill Sterley, the lost decades. decades. It's a very famous uh, paper entitled The Lost Decades. History uh, was at the World Bank. Uh, in spite of policy reform, it has been a seismic paper uh, in, the, in the 90s because this study was a, at the World Bank, a very good macroeconomist. And the title of the paper was The Lost Decade in Spite of Policy Reform. So, given it was within the World Bank, so it has been a, a very well known paper because it was clearly saying, in spite of uh, two decades of structural adjustment, uh, in spite of policy reform, look at the results. So, we can see the the, so uh, uh, may I stop because we started uh, really late. May I stop uh, at eight uh, fifteen or uh, so, uh, seven fifteen?
uh, be, be, because I did not finish I have uh, quite a lot of uh, slides. And so we have a lot of details here. I mean, below zero, when you put details, <coughs> famous 80s and 90s, uh, so called social adjustment um, um, uh, decays. And then uh, we have the 2000s. The 2000s are above zero and have been called prosperous years for the continent. And driven by what? Obviously, we will discuss by what was a key driver in the 2000s for African economies? China. 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 So China demands. And then we have after uh, 2014, uh, a shift in commodity prices. And of course, you can see something quite substantial, which is of course the COVID. And we, we, we don't know, we don't know, I mean, today, we will know maybe in three months, if it is like this or if the, uh, the period, the so called period of the 2000s, will resume again or not. It may not be the case. I mean, we don't know what will happen to the geopolitical events. Uh, but it may not happen because you will see in the slides that one of the drivers, if China is viewed today as a driver of Africa growth, precisely it's a vulnerability, not only for the reason of German external demand, but it is never good to depend on the growth of a key uh, trading partner because precisely China growth is currently uh, not really declining, but at least uh, re recomposed by, by its own drivers. And African economies can be, for many observers, quite worried because the des deceleration of China growth and the change of the composition of its own growth, which is based on internal consumption with a huge amount of debt, as everybody knows, etc., within China, may have very serious negative impact on uh, African economies. Because, of course, if China is uh, uh, less uh, uh, based on uh, investing abroad, uh, trading cheap, uh, manufactured products abroad, etc., it will have an impact. And, and so, as you know, um, economic growth uh, there are stages of economic growth uh, in terms of the type of product you need. That is, for instance, in terms of metals or oil, etc. Below a certain level of GDP, you will need, I don't know, a lot of iron or whatever. Above a certain another um, level of GDP, your demand on, let's say, uh, primary materials such as uh, iron may decline and you will need, need more in need of, let's say, rare earths. Because, of course, if you make, for instance, uh, I don't know, uh, <coughs> memories or etc., your demand in, in copper will be, for instance, less than your demand in lithium or uh, cobalt or coltan or whatever. Coltan, by the way, the demand is declining today because the batteries are not based on coltan as before. So, which means that uh, not only deceleration of China growth, but the change in the composition of China growth itself, which is a very natural cycle, but it will enormously impact. Uh, okay, so we have seen the successive period. Let us say that at least four periods of growth and the mystery question, I'm unable to answer like this, is, is it possible that all these four periods will um, may correspond to different drivers? which is a very, uh, as this is a question to my students, which is extremely nasty too. Uh, but very often I, uh, I was proposing at SOAS uh, essays of do each period, uh, 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 does each period correspond to different drivers of growth? Mm -hmm. Which is in fact an impossible question. But at least this is a, a possible question. Uh, uh, how to explain these different periods? So, because in fact the commodity problem was present before the 2000s. So it's uh, uh, just to, to highlight the complexity of the issue. 
Okay, this is an IMF graph, and this IMF graph uh, uh, is quite optimistic and, and, and thinks that uh, uh, the projection that, in fact, uh, if, of course, there is no other COVID or uh, Ukraine war or whatever, uh, normally uh, African economies should rebound. And uh, this graph is interesting in the sense that it heavily distinguishes the non-resource-based uh, economies and the resource-based economies. And for the IMF, consistently insist, uh, which is new because 10 years ago, the IMF was not at all recognizing the commodity problem. It is precisely people like Natico, Nisanke, Altad, etc., who, who, who insisted you cannot bypass the commodity problem because it was not in classical in classical theory. We can see that same shape, you see, but at the same time, resource based economy are projected to uh, behave. Uh, in a much more negative way than the, because oil, oil, oil is really a, a, a big issue, such a fluctuating. So this is just for fun because the graph will be different uh, next year. Uh, this is uh, from the last IMF uh, annual report, B annual report on Africa uh, growth outlook, Africa regional outlook, and it is just uh, insisting on the fact that countries differ in Africa and the contribution of, uh, this is a very telling graph saying that the countries behaving well in 2022-23 are not the same economies which are doing well in 2023 and 24. I see this is really incredible to see how, in fact, from one year to the other, the economies which are uh, faring well are, in fact, not the same at all. Burkina Faso was doing well, supposedly well, last year, which is uh, the case. Uh, in fact, we, the, uh, this graph is showing that they are quite optimistic for next year. We will see. But that countries, again, I insist, uh, differ. I pass very quickly because, in fact, we are uh, very important. Many papers don't do this distinction when we talk about African growth, which is that we can analyze growth from per capita income, okay, or rate of growth. We don't see the same thing at all. Rwanda, Ethiopia are the best example of that. In terms of growth rate, we are very happy because they were spectacular over the last uh, uh, two decades. Uh, there is nothing to, to discuss. I mean, the driver of this growth are, I mean, quite different, by, by the way, but of course, I, I often insist on this graph. We can see that uh, inserted in even other African economies, I mean, it's not the US or Switzerland or whatever, within Africa, uh, concentrating on growth can be very misleading because, in fact, when you grow from extremely low level of per capita income, of course, it is spectacular, but it is just passing from 4,000, 400. Uh, uh, euros per capita to 800 euros per capita, which is still, again, uh, uh, very deep poverty. And even within Africa, and we see this outlier, we have plenty of paper on that, but it is, if we believe in, uh, in, 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 in the statistics, which uh, we are not obliged to believe, what, what happened in Botswana is absolutely uh, unbelievable. This is really incredible. And again, uh, uh, Botswana being typically a commodity based economy. This is, uh, so we have many papers, uh, so we have Semoglu, Robinson, etc., uh, plenty of, but it is still a mystery because it is an economy which is based on diamonds. So uh, with a cartel, of course, we know that this is a very organized uh, uh, type of economy, but is uh, still a commodity and a bit of cattle and, uh, and, and industry. Okay, so now what are the main of the uh, of growth classically in economic theory? I just make uh, some uh, uh, re re reminding of uh, what they are, and uh, we will see then do China, does China uh, correspond to this canonical 
uh, drivers, of course, and we will see yes and no. So the first canonical driver is investment. So you would be, be surprised. Investment is, uh, since uh, the very classical solo swan growth model, viewed as a, as a key driver of economic growth, so typically physical capital. Then came <coughs> so-called endogenous growth theories, which insisted that this be beside the two classical factors of economic growth, labor and capital, there was a famous TFP, total factor of productivity, which is a combination of labor and capital, and in fact, referring to uh, innovation, technology, education, human capital, skills, that is how do you combine the big uh, mass of labor on the one hand, capital on the other, so this is the accepted uh, canon today, that is TFP, total factor productivity, innovation, etc. technology is a key driver of economic uh, growth uh, today. So you have billions of papers, it's economic trick, paper trying to calculate the contribution of the TFP, but this is what uh, uh, Aguillon, uh, Orit, etc., Dozy, enfin, what are the big specialists of economic growth in the world today, human capital, innovation, technology. Ah, so this is quite important because you see immediately the necessity to industrialize, and, which is, uh, and of course, the necessity of what? Of universities, schools, education, uh, etc. But not only because the TFP is an interesting, the so-called residual, because schools and universities are not only necessary, but how you use school and university. You can have billions of universities somewhere in the country, but if there are no linkages, thanks Yachman, uh, or Preby, or Singer, etc., so they can be a pure enclave without any spillover effect, etc. So, then, uh, second uh, big driver of economic growth, export structure, market structure, export structure. And here we go back to the big issue, which is volatility, volatility. The IMF now accepts completely, uh, the second time, that volatility is a key driver of uh, stagnation or economic growth, <coughs> with a very strong correlation between volatility and stagnation. That is, uh, the more an economy receives shocks and shocks and shocks, uh, the very fact that shocks, an economy is exposed to many shocks, is enough for explaining stagnation. It's exactly like a human being. How do you say in English, a slap uh, in your face? You say, if you receive one, it's okay. But if you receive during the whole day, uh, 100 of slaps, you, you just collapse. And so the, it, it's really recent, and now it is really an acceptable. <coughs> and volatility is perceived <coughs> by for consensus today. And so here I put a graph uh, which is not very telling, but saying, trying to see the, if there is some uh, pattern which is uh, uh, associating a uh, commodity <coughs> index. So it is a real time because it is an index. Uh, of energy price on the one hand, non-energy price on the, on the other hand, and SSR, uh, uh, Africa growth. And we can see that at the beginning, there was actually no correlation between the two prices. Now we see the final financialization of commodities, that is, energy and non-energy uh, started together in the 2000, which is because it is the same bonds and carbon, which are uh, 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 conveying orange juice from Florida or oil or rice from Thailand, etc. So they are completely financialized in the object of, the, of the stock exchange, etc. And here you can see quite, I think, um, uh, um, the lines which, which are working I mean, together. So we can see African GDP and here uh, at least it works quite well for the energy price which is gas and oil. Uh, and, and the shock has been the same in, in France or in, in Europe, because as you know, electricity prices in France has been multiplied by 10 uh, last year. And so it has been very, I don't know what happened in Portugal, because in France the shock has been smoothed by, by the enormous state subsidies, but when there were no subsidies, and multiplying electricity by 10, uh, 
Wall Baker, so imagine the sacred, sacred bakers in France, many have closed because they could not. Uh... So, but at least, uh, second factor, second determinants, the ratio of volatility. So, uh, shocks, as I said, shocks are now absolutely uh, viewed as a, a key driver of economic growth. And here we can see, because again, the question will be at the end, what is the role of China here, you see? And, uh, but, so this is accepted. And in fact, shocks are not something so new because the old Dutch disease model, I don't know if you have heard about the disease, but in fact, uh, were very clearly say exactly the same thing uh, 40 years ago. Uh, so the <coughs> disease is quite a very efficient, uh, I think, uh, uh, model regarding. But again, uh, we don't know. I'd la like to finish one section with saying yes, but uh, again, if we believe in this issue of volatility as uh, 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 driving shocks and shocks driving uh, stagnation, we cannot explain the growth of the US, which has been an economy based on commodity at the end of the 20, 20, 19th century, typically, I mean, the gold rush, uh, etc. And of course, Scandinavian countries, completely based on oil, wood, etc. New Zealand, which is very commodity-based economy, Australia, Canada, etc. So, of course, in, in one hour, you cannot say much, but I just wanted to insist that this issue, each point, each dimension of the driver of economic growth, in fact, conveys its own debate and contradiction. That is, yes, <coughs> in fact, what happened in uh, commodity-based economies such as New Zealand and Australia meant that, in fact, they were not affected as African economies by uh, shocks. And this is uh, so third big canonical uh, um, uh, driver of growth. It is the famous initial condition, which uh, the literature calls also endowments. And this is just adding uh, confusion and chaos in the theory because uh, initial conditions, so called initial conditions, are classically viewed as key drivers of economic growth. But what are initial conditions? They can be everything that is mm -hmm. uh, geography, uh, so uh, to be in a desert, uh, a desert or whatever, landlocked, uh, mm -hmm. so typically you have geography. Uh, you have also, as initial condition, uh, um, you can say that policy uh, issues are initial condition. Suppose, for instance, uh, I don't know, you can say that the fact that uh, Russia, uh, Russia was a communist economy during almost a century is an initial condition uh, for what can happen after the end of the communist. <coughs> even political economy, policy variable, etc., can be viewed as the state of education for example, is typically an initial condition. You you are the president of a new president of a country where the rate of literacy is close to zero. This is an initial condition. It is enormously constraining your policy decisions, and of course, the prospect for economic growth. Uh, so it is clear that initial condition is a very interesting um, uh, uh, concept, I think, but incredibly uh, complex because, of course, education is a result of a past policy. So you say my policy today is a result of a past policy. So it is typically a chicken and egg uh, type of uh, uh, causality. Okay, uh, Gareth Austin, which, uh, which is an excellent economic historian regarding Africa, has you know, book enormously insisted on the issue of endowments, uh, uh, initial condition, and typically demography. Demography, as you know, has been viewed by many economic historians, including Gareth Austin, uh, as a big issue because, in fact, the continent has been viewed. Uh, over the last two centuries, uh, you can read the paper by Austin and others, uh, as a um, non enough populated uh, part of the world compared, for instance, to Asia. Mm -hmm. And if you believe in the economic geography uh, argument, uh, typically Krugman mm -hmm. saying that the dim dissemination of ideas mm -hmm. are absolutely crucial for economic growth, clearly you can explain that Asia was much better endowed mm -hmm. than Africa for the dissemination of ideas. And this is really the basis of the Silicon Valley, etc., mm -hmm. that is densely populated area are more favorable for the dissemination of people, mm -hmm. uh, ideas, etc. 
So, of course, if you uh, have a great uh, density of population, which is one person per square kilometer, let's mm -hmm. say in the Niger or Mali, etc., plus very uh, many obstacles uh, coming from the uh, pedology, climate, uh, no infrastructure, etc., it is clear, and we can add that state formation, as argued by uh, Jeffrey Herbst, is in fact much more difficult because how can you levy taxes? in a country where your next neighbor and the person you can extract tax from the person is 500 kilometers far and you have no road, no oil, uh, nothing, etc. So this issue of geography, the nexus demography and geography is typically something which is quite important for uh, as a driver of economic growth. Okay? And so increasing returns, etc., and demography. So, uh, Frank Emma and Va Va I don't know how to pronounce, who are incredibly good, interesting economic historian. They are based in uh, Wageningen, I, I, I think. They uh, say, they argue that today demography could be, could be the, uh, an opportunity because, in fact, it could be given demography, uh, precisely the absence of a, a demographic transition, which is interesting because usually it is as an obstacle, not by the world, but as an obstacle to growth. And they say, in fact, this small window of opportunity today uh, of a very uh, high demography in Africa could be a basis for labor and uh, uh, a kind of Asian uh, model, uh, labor intensive economic growth. And here, China is, of course, uh, we will see quite present because, of course, outsourcing the classical model of China, having outsourced its factories to Africa mm -hmm. for labor intensive, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because now mm -hmm. wages in, in China are very high, could be precisely this is why it is of the demographic dimension, could be an opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, this is. Okay, now the third uh, classical driver of growth is uh, uh, good policies. This is a traditional that is, of course, we have investment, etc. But how? What is the policy you uh, you can implement? And here we see the enormous difficulty of uh, reasoning because not only you have to devise the policy, but you are you have to be able as a as a government to make a credible policy and a policy which can be implemented. Do you agree? We see how it is combined. The next is geography. And policy that is again you are in the air Congo, okay. You have excellent ideas in Kinshasa. You would like absolutely they are made by students from uh, Cesar, uh, Soas, etc. They come to Kinshasa with wonderful ideas, but I mean, of course, the impact in Goma or Kisangani or whatever of your wonderful idea will never reach the city because you simply have absolutely no road except all the. Ukrainian play uh, to, to go to, and the capacity, to, the policy issue is of course enormously pertinent as a driver of economic growth and typically investment in, in, in the domain, in the regional productivity, etc. But of course, the cap and it is so important for Africa um, uh, that is, uh, we see the nexus as a capacity of issue, which capacity of implementing this policy. You, you got them, which is enormous Then, uh, uh, in this section, what is important is, of course, good policies. What, what is a good policy? And here we know that between so called neoliberal, uh, etc., and uh, let's say more heterodox uh, issues, the content of what is a relevant policy is completely uh, the opposite. So, and, uh, and uh, <coughs> let's say the tension, the debate, the conflict is between mm -hmm. state intervention, so heavy self intervention, industrial policies, policies, and the hands off uh, type of policies typically defended by the World Bank. Uh, uh, and, and, and so far, <laughs> we will see in Argentina <laughs> what will be the result of the general privatization <laughs> of everything. Uh, but uh, I, without any caricature, there are arguments for both. Uh, because the so-called costly uh, protection of subsidies in the industry is not a completely stupid argument. I mean, we know it has happened in 
uh, but we know that with the Wutawateli state and since Mariana Mazzucato and all the people who have worked on the industrialization in the US, we have shown that even in the most so-called open economy like the US, the state has enormously um, uh, subsidized the industrialization, etc. Okay, so this is a debate on the good policy, quickly, and of course, the five uh, accepted driver of economic growth today <coughs> is, as I said, the so-called nexus of institution. And again, here I insist that for all the other classical determinants, we have exactly the same debate, that is yes, but no. That is, first, institution, we feel that it is relevant, that uh, uh, state of right, uh, security of property rights, etc., law enforcement, uh, well functioning markets, good, uh, uh, this is very plausible that it can be good for both. But at the same time, we immediately say what is an institution? I mean, to define the very concept of institution, see, it was my own research, we will go back uh, many, many years, that is the impossibility to define what is an institution. What is, is it an object? This is not an object, an institution. It is a composite nexus of uh, names, belief, legitimacy, completely heterogeneous uh, issue. Democracy is at the same time a name. I mean, we know that it can be only a name. We know well, unfortunately, but at the same time, uh, um, people may believe that the democracy is relevant or not. Today, it seems that many people even in the West see the democracy finally is not so necessary, and finally, a good authoritarian state could be much more efficient in France, for instance, and etc. So, institutions, especially political institutions, are very difficult to define. So, yes, we feel that they are driving of economic growth, but at the same time, if we cannot define the, the, what they are, we cannot define the impact. An econometric paper, millions, thousand paper, trying to find the econometric relationship between democracy and growth, and it is possible. And why is it impossible? Because precisely, democracy can be de jure or de facto on paper or in reality. And so, uh, India is a big democracy, but we feel that it is not the same as the democracy under Pericles or in the Greek or democracy in Côte d'Ivoire, etc. So this is a big, big problem with the issue of good governance, etc. The difference between forms and content. That is, we can we can have a formal institution, a court, a tribunal, etc. But the content can be completely uh, context specific. And, uh, and this is a big issue that is in, in case. We... So now we move to China. So in this context, uh, could China be a contributor of economic growth? And we will see that the answer is not at all a simple uh, answer. So China, of course, we feel that it is a driver of international price prices. Uh, so we feel that the impact of the relationship with China-Africa uh, can clearly have an impact of SSR uh, growth because China is driving some prices. We will see that not all commodity prices, I can say not oil, for instance, China is not the driver of oil prices. The driver of oil prices are the US mm -hmm. and not uh, China. Mm -hmm. And so it's a driver of demand. So you see two levels, China drives prices and China drives demand. And so demand for African uh, good. Uh, okay, so uh, this is uh, at, at first uh, sight, and as I said uh, before, also the second block of linkage is a spillover effect of China on growth. As I said, the composition of China growth, what type of spillover on Africa. So the first uh, big block of causalities is investment, China investment, and, and then we will see the second driver, which is China trade, and I will conclude with China contribution to institutions, which you may feel immediately that it is not maybe an obvious driver of growth in uh, Africa. So if we review the three uh, canonical blocks of uh, drivers of growth, investment, China investment, China uh, trade, and China uh, contribution to institution, we will see that the answer is really, really uh, complex. 
So what is China investment in SSA? Consider that, again, investment is considered as a key driver of economic growth. We will see that, in fact, uh, it is very small, very, very modest. And so uh, uh, why is it so modest? First, because, as I said before, investment is extremely difficult to define. And so if we take, so we would be very happy, we feel that it is China could contribute enormously to Africa growth because at least, this is my, my view, at least it is uh, breaking the face-to-face -face relationship between France and the francophone uh, economies. Uh, that is, the number of players before was really, really limited. So China is, is coming in the game as a new player, which is, in any case, good per se. That is, the more players there are, the better. And it is a literature in China Africa on the famous Africa Agency. Now the China Africa literature is uh, very substantially working on what is agency from African government vis-a-vis -vis China investment, which is very good because the more players there are, the more African government are able to choose and to play investors uh, one against another, which is the uh, Africa Agency and which is quite uh, something I think very positive. But the problem is uh, investment is incredibly difficult to define. There is a canonical uh, definition, UMTAD, and UMTAD, uh, the definition, uh, IMF, UMTAD, and all the uh, international agencies have the same definition, which is a certain proportion of property rights for the investor in the project, at least 10%. Uh, so, you are an investor, if I invest in the DSA, I, I, I should have a 10% minimum of uh, rights, shares in, in ISA. Immediately, you see the difficulty in this definition, that is a long-lasting, the definition, technical definition of term, is a long-lasting interest in the project, and a property rights minimum 10% project. Immediately, you see that the famous huge infrastructure project that China is driving in Africa don't fall into this definition. I mean, they are quite complex, we will see. You. But at the first sight, to build a bridge, uh, for instance, which is reimbursed with a, a toll at the entrance of the bridge, is not a property right. So, and it is typically a service, a provision of service. So, Thierry Perrault, who is a French sinologist, uh, working on the Chinese investment quite seriously, has made uh, many papers saying, and Deborah Braukigam, who is running uh, in the US the China Africa Initiative at the Johns, Johns uh, Hopkins University, they insist, uh, they made plenty of papers saying, in fact, investment, Chinese investment is quite uh, limited, and China is firstly a service provider through construction project, but much more than an uh, investor. So, because, again, to build a stadium, to build a road, to build is not an investment. Uh, so, uh, this is quite it. Uh, uh, I hope to have the time to finish, but we will see at the end that this uh, sentence is, in fact, not completely true, because infrastructure, per se, is a very heavy contributor to growth. Mm -hmm. That is, at the end, that is, uh, of course, if the road falls after the first, uh, falls down after the first rain season, it's not good, but it happened to the French many times. I mean, uh, I, I know that uh, in Guinea or, uh, uh, that is, if I were so badly built that in fact they did not contribute to anything, but Typically, good telecom, good roads, uh, ports, etc., are of course uh, increasing connectivity and hence economic growth. But China is a service provider, not, not uh, uh, an investor. So Chinese FDI is modest so, uh, compared to, to total FDI foreign direct investment from China. Uh, other emerging countries invest in SSA, so Turkey, <coughs> Russia, India, but much smaller, there is no discussion that it's much, much smaller than. Uh, so, uh, as I said, in stock, Chinese investment are quite small in, uh, in, uh, in Southern Africa. And here, this is the IMF graph, and we see in blue, China in stock, uh, so the accumulation of stock 
uh, Chinese stocks uh, in terms of investment, it's not much, you see, and it is not, uh, this is a COVID, uh, COVID has incredibly impacted two years without anything in the whole world, but do you see in blue that, uh, in fact, in, term, in terms of stock, uh, the, the traditional <coughs> colonizer uh, Western economies are remain euro euro <coughs> Uh, the US remain quite uh, much less than before because of oil, of course. So China is not the uh, Chinese FDI are not so important in terms of size, but in reverse, China is not the major destination of Chinese FDI. Of course, the Chinese invest in Portugal, yeah. in uh, uh, in, in the West, in the US, uh, etc. But for China, construction projects are quite important. The African construction projects remain quite uh, 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 important. Okay, so this is a graph from CARI, who is the best place in the world computing <coughs> with difficult Chinese investment. And we see that it is in flows. So you see that uh, it is in flows. And U.S. investment was in the late uh, 2010 uh, in flows much more important than uh, Chinese. You see, ah, so you, you will have in any case the, the, the share this, uh, this graph with ple pleasure. And we see that it varies in terms of flow between the big players of the U.S. and the... Uh, and, uh, but do you see, because I don't want to... I have still not, nothing to say. Do you see that the amounts are quite small? Look at this graph. In fact, it is what? Uh, six billions, you see, uh, eight billions as a, at the scale of Africa. It's really not much, you see. And again, for those who are interested, these uh, figures are not so telling in the sense that one investment, of course, can be put in check in terms of flow from one year to the other. Just one, one investment, let's say, in a huge dam or whatever, of three or four or five billion of dollars, which is a big investment, completely changed from one year to the other the, the profile of investment. So this is very difficult to deal with this. So uh, Chinese investment is also very well known uh, through the famous Belt and Road, yeah. the BRI uh, initiative. So, very important uh, dimension of the BRI. I have no time. First, SSA is not a major player in BRI. As you know, this is Central uh, Europe, uh, Kazakhstan, etc., Central Asia, and uh, etc., Greece. Uh, uh, first, but China is a player in terms of the maritime silk road, the so called maritime mm -hmm. silk road, which is through the famous port uh, in Kenya. Uh, Tanzania, Djibouti, of course, etc. So, first dimension of the BRI, so through the connectivity of uh, ports, you have now a huge literature on that. Second dimension, which is really interesting, it is the so called, I will try to finish at 8 30, uh, the, the patient capital. That is BRI, you have now many, many books on, on BRI, which are quite interesting, and they say, okay, uh, what is important is that they exemplify, contrary to other types of investors, the notion of patient capital. It is not profitable today, but maybe it will be profitable tomorrow. And of course, you have the political economy dimension, the political influence, etc., etc. But many papers, we have no time for that, are now analyzing BRI country by country, uh, even in Central Asia, uh, in Kazakhstan, I've read this Kazakhstan, saying that now people are more and more critical against BRI and precisely the famous African agency is saying that, okay, the agency, the concept of agency, okay, you really want to invest in the BRI, but it will be at its own terms, etc. I mean, there is now a big political decision. So, but what is important is that it is improving infrastructure and connecting hubs, the famous uh, SGR standard zone railway uh, connecting Kenya and other countries, uh, the famous uh, industrial zone in Bagamoyo in Tanzania, etc. That is, yes, uh, BRI, I mean, this type of infrastructure may foster regional integration, trade, 
connecting cities, uh, etc. A train is is a train. I mean, this is better than nothing. I mean, there is no discussion that this infrastructure project, I insist on that, are positive uh, at first sight for economic growth. But of course, now we will see the risk. Now we have a risk for the Chinese. I mean, the Chinese are realizing that I mean, this project can be risky for them because we will see that there are different terms regarding uh, this, uh, this, this uh, type of uh, construction project. Um, uh, so I, I, I skip. So either the famous resource for infrastructure project that is we have to uh, put as a collateral uh, oil, blah, blah, etc. Or there are loans only. Uh, this is the next slide. And so immediately you have the famous issue of the payment. And they can generate debt Zambia is in default, etc. So uh, just to say that this uh, infrastructure uh, contract, you see the complexity, yes and no. They contribute to economic growth, but they are risk. And uh, they, they have risk for both sides, for the Chinese and for the, the African uh, uh, party. And also something which is not so positive, of course, the construction contract, they are uh, based on infrastructure, roads, uh, train, etc. But they are also responding to the classical fundamental uh, motive of investment, which is natural resource seeking, market seeking, uh, <coughs> efficiency seeking, etc. And in Africa, we have no illusion. They are quite responding also to the, com to the commodity, to the natural resource seeking. So exactly like for the British or the French, trains are more likely to um, connect a resource, a resource basin, you see, like uh, the first train in Nigeria, was it for tin? It was for tin, no? Uh, that's all. Uh, uh, the first train uh, of the British in Nigeria was connecting the uh, uh, tin mines and, and the port. You see, it was... Uh, uh, so we see that it's, it's all very quite often for connecting, exporting commodities, so it's okay. So infrastructure contract, I, 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 I'm going to be quick. Uh, the first uh, type, as I said, it, it was the first so-called Angola model, uh, saying that, okay, uh, um, uh, putting oil as a collateral for the building of infrastructure, so the risks are absolutely obvious because, of course, uh, you are not controlling uh, then the, the 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 price of the, the future price of the commodity, and if you are like a Congo, for instance, Congo Brazzaville, engaged for twenty years or thirty years, I mean it's not <coughs> a big uh, a big deal. And then uh, loans only, more and more infrastructure projects are now financed by loans only. And Portugal has made quite interesting paper, and now the literature is really concentrated on the generation of debt with this. Uh, but with a lot of ideology, Brautigan is really a specialist in that, that is for the famous Sri Lanka port, it was even in the newspaper, that is the Omatota port saying that uh, Sri Lanka was now uh, completely indebted uh, because the Chinese built the Omatota port, etc. Apparently, uh, uh, Brautigan demonstrated that it is completely false. I mean, we have really also to... to... Okay, so uh, again, the resources for infrastructure deals are not an FDI, are not an investment. You see the complexity. We can <coughs> say that so positive uh, contribution via infrastructure, but not via uh, investment. That is, there is no lasting interest. But it is changing. That is, new China is realizing the risk of this construction uh, contract because it changes every year. And now uh, China, I look at a very recent paper by Chang, 2023, saying that what they call the China globalization of state capital, because it is absolutely driven, all this is driven by the Chinese state, uh, is trying to uh, uh, transform this project in PPPs mm -hmm. because now a uh, private, public private partnership, which are uh, associated to different types of risk, but now there is a global move to PPPs and even the Chinese are leaving the resource for infrastructure contract to try to build via PPPs. Uh, anyway, so I accelerate uh, and China contribute positively uh, via investment to Africa growth through private investment. There's a lot of small and medium enterprise investing in China. And we can assume that these enterprises 
investing mostly in manufacturing goods, in fact, contribute to Africa growth. As I said at the beginning, that is, they uh, invest in factories, making consumer goods, uh, manufactured goods, etc. And per se, uh, it, it, it is a, a, a positive, a positive dimension. And so, China private firm invest in SSR in manufacturing sector in certain uh, countries. In Ghana, we have plenty of studies showing that they drove industrial upgrading of African economies, so China investors are quite there. And as I said before, it is really important and it will last because salaries, wages in China are now so high that it is profitable for China to use a, a very cheap labor of African uh, uh, countries. Okay? So, uh, as I said, building infrastructure, positive, positive, positive investment uh, in uh, African manufactured uh, goods. But I conclude this section on this. Now we know that the impact is maybe not so good because two countries have been investigated, Zambia and Ethiopia. And precisely now uh, they are based on the social dimension of this private investment by Chinese billionaires, etc., in the uh, uh, in the sector of industrial sector in Africa, the level of wages is incredibly low, uh, and also the famous debate, typically Zambia and, uh, and Ethiopia, have been an example of that. That the discussion that what transmission transfer of skills and technology takes place in this type of private investment in manufacture. That is, I insisted on the drivers of economic growth, uh, canonical factor, that is the famous TFP, the famous uh, 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 the combination technology innovation. If, of course, it is like an enclave investment, exactly like the good old investment uh, uh, offshore in Angola, with absolutely no spillover effect, no linkages, it will be the same negative result. That is, if it is an entire manpower from China with Chinese uh, engineers, etc., the key of endogenous growth, which is uh, transfer of technology and skill education, etc., will be exactly the good old Ankara uh, uh, problem. So Ethiopia and Zambia have been uh, uh, investigated by many papers. And that in Zambia, of course, private investor, Chinese industrial sector, mm -hmm. but um, no uh, skill transfers. And uh, Ethiopia has been also uh, uh, an example. If China is the first investor in Ethiopia, typically in the laser uh, se mm -hmm. sector, mm -hmm. and Ethiopia is doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, example. But the paper by Barrett and Roman show that, of course, and promoted by the government, that is, of course, if the government was agreed on this way, the, uh, the government promoted the lowest pay rate in any government in any government in the world, twenty-six dollars uh, per month. Uh, so you see, this is really a big uh, issue. That is, and this is why I insisted on the different dimension of the of growth. Because, okay, we are happy that there are investors in the industrial sector. But at the same time, what type of spillover effect can take place with uh, wages? Okay, so I uh, assess so critique are many, debt, collusion, etc. I mean, the famous uh, technological transfer, etc. Now, five minutes for the trade uh, dimension. Uh, uh, China is contributing to economic growth because it's now the major trade partner uh, of the continent, so there is no discussion, as an individual country. But the EU is the main partner of China. The EU is not uh, one country, but China is the first trade partner in Southern Africa. Uh, uh, um, but the reverse, the asymmetry of uh, power relationship, of course, SSA is not at all the main partner for China. Uh, for China, uh, SSC is a very small uh, player. Uh, so you see, this is the IMF growth. We see the change. Um, uh, what are the international partners 
Okay, so as I said, um, China is a key driver of international commodity <coughs> price, but I insist China is not the main driver of prices. I insist that the oil prices are still driven by the, by the US. But what is a key issue is this that is the imbalance. This is the IMF China bilateral trade is really like an incredible imbalance. China overwhelmingly export manufacturing and uh, imports uh, from Africa primarily products. So the, it has nothing to do with the EU. I mean, the trade is completely uh, uh, imbalanced. <coughs> Look at this. This is a graph I painfully made saying how the UNCTAD can break the series. I mean, uh, uh, but at least it says something, even if the figures are, I think, completely uh, not credible. But at least, what do you see in this graph? You see immediately that if we take the EU, you see the trade structure China and EU, we see what is in red, cues. You see that the structure is absolutely broadly the same. That is, Africa export to China first fuels, SSR export to EU fuels, that's it. And then in blue, we have ores and metals, and we are not surprised that China, for financing, it grows, imports from Africa metals, so copper from Zambia, etc. Metals are quite important from Guinea, Simandou, etc. <coughs> Uh, uh, which is less the case of the EU. You are not surprised because the EU is at the stage of growth where the uh, necessity of metals is less important than for China, which is in the middle of its uh, uh, past maturity. But what we see, I, mean, I think it's incredibly striking, is that oil, uh, Africa is an oil continent. That, that's it. It's, uh, that is, both are really uh, the same. So, of course, immediately you see that what is the contribution to Africa growth? If we see this extremely distorted export structure, it can be very limited because what is oil? Typically, oil is a Dutch disease prone type of product, it is an enclave uh, type of product, etc. And associated to oil, we see many negative things. So, positive. Because, of course, it is uh, resource, fiscal resources for African economies, but negative. And what, what are, why are they negative? Because typically, they lock African economies in the pattern of commodity export. That is, uh, uh, China, in uh, having a demand for oil, consistently uh, uh, cons uh, demand for oil, is, of course, locking in African economy in the export of oil. Because in the good years, I mean, what is the incentive for African economies to go to industry? Because in good years, you have a windfall gain of plenty of dollars coming from oil. Of course, it makes it much more difficult to try to move to social change and to a different uh, economic pattern. Okay, so I uh, accelerate. China is not, uh, of course, entirely in oil, and China invests in textiles, so, which is a second possibility for African economies to industrialize, not only oil, but it is really minor, the garment industry, et cetera, compared to, to uh, oil. And I wanted to insist, and then I will conclude on the situation, that is uh, what I said at the beginning, that is very interestingly, uh, uh, African economies cannot compete. The, 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 the interesting issue second is that even if they were investing in African economies' manufactured products, they would be, this product would compete uh, with, suppose, Anthony Congo, the one that I learned a couple of years ago, an engineer who, who did tablets, tablets uh, all made in Brazzaville, uh, of, uh, adapted to peasant, etc. But I mean, what can be the competitiveness of the Congolese tablets 
always uh, Shenzhen, uh, tablet, uh, which uh, cost uh, uh, 10 euros, uh, uh, etc. It is extremely difficult because, again, we go back to the very traditional uh, driver of growth, which is the size of the market, of course. And this is where Daniel is right. Regional integration is so important. That is, with a huge market, of course, the, we see the complexity of the problem. No investor, no uh, uh, owner, investor in a factory uh, will work for a market of the size of Malawi or in Bissau or whatever. It's uh, and here we go back to the traditional problem. And I conclude on the uh, on the institution. So here the literature is quite consistent. That is, uh, China has been attacked by uh, deals which are characterized by opacity, lack of transparency, collusion, uh, etc. It is clear that the resource for infrastructure contract and oil contract mm -hmm. have been characterized by a lot of uh, uh, opacity. Uh, so it is not uh, sure that they contribute to secure property rights, etc. And the famous fact that everybody knows that China since the beginning, uh, since the <coughs> historical links with Africa, which are from the non-aligned movement, etc., which uh, uh, has al always practiced a hands-off policy, saying we don't want to interfere and to enter within the uh, local uh, political economy, uh, etc. So, of course, we see the <coughs> limits of contribution to the so-called uh, institutional dimension of economic growth. <coughs> but as for all sections, I will contradict this point with another point saying that, OK, the end of policy is a bit, uh, let's say, shocking. Uh, that is, I can work with uh, uh, the most uh, despotic uh, whatever government. But we have to put this in perspective with the Western uh, countries. And the Western countries with a heavy conditionality associated with the IFI lending, which was conditional to the most intrusive degrees in uh, many economies, I know quite a bit West Africa, uh, we know now that this heavy condi conditionality, which is next month I want to see this, I want the education sector, I want the privatization of this, etc. First, has not been uh, at all feasible. Uh, so with a very classical game theory model of the more you will demand, the less I will do. And the, as a government, African government, the less I will, re the more I will resist to your uh, accumulation of condition. And we didn't see any correlation. Uh, so precisely uh, Gervin and also uh, the famous paper by Kenti Kellinis, I don't know if you know uh, Kenti yeah. Kellinis, mm -hmm. was in Oxford and he has been absolutely breakthrough yes. papers on uh, the explosion of conditionality of the IFI so two or three years ago. And he has demonstrated that uh, Ebola, mm -hmm. a very breakthrough paper, that mm -hmm. Ebola could explode because of the conditionality in the health sector in Sierra Leone and Liberia, which has been, and uh, this is the first time the IMF was even has been obliged to, to respond. So, and so you see, as a counter argument, I will argue that in fact, okay, this hands of policy, non institutional, uh, et cetera, I don't care, I don't, this internal politics, at the same time, has to be matched with Western conditionality and Western conditionalities, there is no uh, uh, demonstration at all that this conditionality has been good for growth. That is, and Kenti Kellinis has uh, brilliantly demonstrated that the accumulation of conditionalities has per se been negative for education sector, the uh, sector and so on. So you see the difficulty of argument that is okay, uh, no ends of policy, acquisition of conditionality, in fact, has been also uh, uh, um, uh, negative. Uh, okay, uh, so the famous exchange of finance for deep policy reform. I even made a working paper here, everybody will read on the issue of conditionality in 2016. And that's it. So I conclude, 
and saying uh, I, I was just trying to to of course to highlight the complexity to the uh, of a very traditional question which is does China contribute to Africa growth? Now I think you have some elements saying that the answer is a bit difficult to address and you can read the, the PowerPoint. Okay, sorry for having been uh, we have started with some and very long.